day after the Dunkirk evacuation ended, the papers celebrated a miracle and the country rejoiced at having brought its army home. But the soldiers of the 51st Highland Division weren't among them. I never knew nothing about Dunkirk at no time. They were still in France. As the Germans invaded, the 51st were pulled back to the town of Abbeville. They were now on the front line, fighting alongside the French to try and stop Hitler's forces invading the rest of France. The next thing we knew were dragged back up to Abbeville, and that's the first really big battle we had. By the time we did get up into the Abbeville area, things were awful. There's nothing what wasn't burnt down or exploded in front of you nearly. Everything was chaotic. Abbeville was literally shattered. We're fighting at every back street. We were just going back from one street to another, and the Germans were stolen. And the whole place was a mess. The next thing we saw was a crowd of Frenchies running across in front of us, shouting La Boche. La Boche, that's when the tanks were coming. They just stormed off, and we were left holding it. I was pretty scared. You tell me anybody that wasn't. After a week of relentless fighting, the 51st's commanding officer, General Victor Fortune, had had enough. He says, I've been holding a ridiculous front since the 31st of May, in addition to having a troublesome battlefront, which is putting it mildly, in the middle of it. I'm only too ready to keep a sense of proportion, but I owe my soldiers some loyalty. And I quite candidly state, it is sheer murder to keep us on a 19-mile front 24 hours longer. Fortune's plea to withdraw fell on deaf ears. Churchill feared the French might surrender and was determined to reassure them. I sang my usual song. We would fight on whatever happened. It is vital that the French keep fighting. But it is also absolutely vital that the British are seen to support their ally. You're there to save the French and you fight until the last, and you're the last out. The 51st's mission was now clear. Fight on with the French and survive as long as possible. The French campaign is going to only end one way. It is not a question of if, it is a question of when the French capitulate. And from the British perspective, it is vital that the French capitulate as far down the line as is humanly possible. On the 6th of June, Abbeville fell to the Germans. The 51st and their allies from the French 9th Army were now being forced back from one defensive line to another. Suffering the full ferocity of the Nazi onslaught. Along the road, there was all civilians who had been machine gunned from the air. There was bodies, children, women, men. Loads of them. The Stokers, it was the bombs that dropped. They used to scream as it came down the bomb, and then explode. Their tanks, we thought, were battleships. They were attacking with the tanks and shells. The artillery it was getting worse and worse. We were losing men all the way. The Germans were on a very fast run, and once you start retreating, you keep going until you're pushed right out. Having lost or abandoned most of their heavy weaponry, the 51st were left facing the German army with little more than small arms. They were armed with every bit of equipment you can think of. They were using everything under the sun. The 
just had our rifles. We was very unarmed, very, very much indeed. The Germans were better equipped all round. A perfect illustration of just how outgunned the 51st were on the retreat from Abbeville is seen by comparing their main machine gun with what the Germans were using. This is the standard light machine gun for the British Army, and it became known as the Bren. This was the 51st section support weapon. If you had a Bren gun in your regiment, you was lucky. You're supposed to have several, but they were so short. It was developed during the 1930s. It operated from a 30-round box magazine, went on very quickly. That's it fitted. It fires the standard rifle round. It had a slow rate of fire of only 520 rounds per minute. It also had one major problem with this gun. It was very, very accurate, which is not really ideal for a machine gun. Accuracy is good, but what you want a machine gun to do is put a wide arc of fire out when you're firing bursts. And the idea of that is you keep as many heads down by putting down suppressive fire. If you hit the enemy, that's just an added bonus. German MG34 had a high rate of fire of 800 rounds per minute, so it outclassed the Bren gun for suppressive fire. We kept diving into the ditches and the canals that try to avoid the machine gunning. It also used 250 round belts. Very useful because you don't have to keep changing the magazine. We lost a good food by the machine gunning. At the time when it was manufactured, it probably was the Rolls Royce of machine guns. By the 8th of June, as well as being outgunned, the 51st were now being outmaneuvered to the east by General Erwin Rommel. What Rommel manages to do with his 7th Panzer Division is break through and thrust southwards. And he actually does 60 miles in one day. I mean, it's this extraordinary speed. Still under orders to stay with the slower French forces, General Fortune and the 51st Highland Division were unable to move fast enough to outrun Rommel. On the 9th of June, Rommel's panzers reached the Normandy coast. Which means that the 51st Highland Division, as well as the French 31st Division, are now completely encircled. The Germans appeared to have the 51st at their mercy. However, one man refused to give up on them. Admiral William James, Commander-in-Chief of Naval Forces in Portsmouth. Portsmouth was a command area. He controlled a large stretch of coast from New Haven all the way down to Dorset, and he was the naval officer in charge of that entire sector of the English Channel based in Portsmouth Harbour. When Admiral James learned of the plight of the 51st, without any official War Office sanction, he began to organise a flotilla of boats to launch a rescue mission. Some of these were Dutch barges, transport vessels. Some of these had just returned from Dunkirk. He also sent his flag lieutenant into the Hamble River, where he started gathering a number of private yachts ready to go over. But there's still no idea as to when this evacuation might take place. The plan was to evacuate the 51st from saint valery on coe On a coastline of steep cliffs, this small fishing port offered the only harbour and beaches where a mass evacuation could be attempted. By the 10th of June, Admiral James had gathered a flotilla numbering 207 boats, easily enough to accommodate what remained of the 51st. Boats would need time to get into saint Valery, embark troops and get out again. So, along with their French allies, the 51st created a defensive ring around the town. Private Don Smith was with the 4th Seaforth Highlanders to the east of saint Valery. Now age 97, he still remembers where he was told to set up his machine gun. Here we are. That's it. Orders were, hold this line, 
right across these fields. We're talking three battalions at least, and then stretched across, what was left of us anyway. And we were looking for the enemy coming towards us. I was on the machine gun there, covering the field down that side and the road so that I could swing round with the gun. We'd been on the move day after day. We just had to get there and line up, get the guns up ready. Because we hadn't, we, hadn't, we hadn't time to dig in. All we had time to do, flatten ourselves out on the ground, get the guns set up, and that was it. The 51st were now surrounded. Their only hope was to hold out long enough to be saved by Admiral James's rescue flotilla. Saint Valery would be their last stand.